Hello and welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. In this episode, I'll be talking with John White, a Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Arkansas and one of the foremost engineering authorities in America about effective leadership in engineering. He provides some great tips that you can start using right away to become the best possible leader in your field. I'm your host, Jeff Perry, founder of More Than Engineering and creator of the Engineering Career Accelerator Program, helping engineers and technology professionals with leadership and career coaching to create meaningful careers and lives. And this is the Engineering Engineering Career Coach Podcast brought to you by EMI, the first podcast dedicated to helping engineers and technical professionals with both their personal and professional development. Now it's time to jump into the main segment of our episode. Today I have the pleasure to have with me John White, a Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Arkansas. John, welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's great to be here with you. Absolutely. So we're so excited to to have you here. Can you please tell our listeners a little bit about you and and some of your career story, and uh, what are you up to these days? Well, it's a. I'm the son of educators. My dad was a high school English teacher and an administrator. My mom is an elementary school teacher. Uh, my sister was a high school math teacher. I married a high school teacher. I, teaching was all in my family, but when I graduated in engineering, I went to work with uh, Tennessee Eastman Company, which was a chemicals, plastics, fibers division of Eastman Kodak Company. And um, my career path was going to be, I was going to come in as an entry level engineer, and I was going to very quickly become the CEO of Eastman Kodak. I mean, that, that was just, you know, it's going to happen so quick, you know. And the next thing I knew, I wound up, I had an unbelievable opportunity to go to Virginia Tech uh, to be a tenure track, and I didn't even know what that meant, a tenure track instructor uh, to support myself through graduate school to get a master's degree. And when I went into my first class to teach, I realized I knew what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. It was just amazing. So then I was faced with this dilemma because I'm a big fan of Robert Frost. And so he says, you come to a path and you follow the one less traveled. No, here were these two paths. Be in business or be in academe. And I thought, why do I have to choose? Why can't I do both? Right. And so my career path has been to keep my foot in industry and keep my foot in the university. And I've been able to pull that off, Jeff. Not many people have been able to do that. But uh, it took a lot of work. And it, in fact, it, I had a, uh, a leader who told me I was making a big career mistake by trying to do that. But later on, he told me, he said, you know, John, you were right. And I was wrong. I just followed my strength. I followed my heart. In fact, that's what I tell students all the time is don't overthink this thing. You know, that they say that while people plan, God's laughing. Well, you know, we can come up with these plans and that's great, but get ready. What you think tomorrow is going to hold isn't going to hold it at all. It's going to be something new and opportunity for you will develop. So Absolutely. So, so a winding road of your career, but able to do a lot of different things in academia and industry. And recently you released a book. On, on leadership called Why It Matters, Reflection on Practical Leadership. So I'm curious to learn more about this book and how you feel like it can help uh, engineers and engineering leaders that might be listening to the show. Well, this this was a, a first for me, not doing the book. I had done six uh, engineering textbooks, Jeff, but this is the first book I've done that didn't have equations in it. So <laughs> it's really, really quite different. different for me. But when I stepped down, as Chancellor of the University of Arkansas returned the faculty, several colleagues said, you got to write a leadership book. You got to do that. And then I said, well, no, no. Well, then you got to teach a leadership class, teach a leadership class. And so I said, well, I'm not, I don't even know how to do that because all the courses that I've taught, like I say, they were chock full of equations. So I set out to do that. And um, then after teaching this class, nine different offerings in my very last meeting with the class the students just they presented me with a gift thanked me for what i'd done and said would you please try to write a book where you capture in the book 
what happened in this class. It's like nothing we've ever experienced. Kids on the online evaluation of the course was done anonymously, but they consistently said it's the most demanding course I've taken. It's the best course I've taken and it changed my life. That is until the last offering. And one student said, Dr. White said it would be the most demanding and it was. He said it would be the best and it was. He said that it would change my life, but it didn't. It saved my life. And I knew I had to write the book. And so yeah. during the pandemic, I devoted 18 months to two years to trying to capture what happened in that course and the learnings that we had in there, as well as other things I had learned along the way in my leadership journey. So that's what the book is about, the reflections on practical leadership. Maybe it should have been reflections on leadership practice, but I wanted people to know that this isn't about leadership theories or anything like that, but rather it's based on the tough slogging through the ditches and the woods and all of that of leadership. It's both the, the joys and the disappointments along the way. It's a brutally frank discussion of leadership because in my class, we in 16 weeks semester, we would have a guest leader 15 of those weeks. And we had a couple of rules. It says no recording what the leaders say and what said here stays here. And there would be at least three of those leaders who would be in tears as they were meeting with the kids. And they just came in open kimono there. I remember Greg Brown, the chairman at Motorola came into the first meeting and he walked in and he said, now I know the syllabus says I'm gonna leave here at 715, but I'm not leaving as long as you've got questions. That plane will not leave the airport without me. And at 8.15, I finally said, hey, Greg, I got to stop. We got to cover some other things. And he's, so the kids took a break. He came and he said, I've not had so much fun. I can't tell you when. Can I come back again this semester? And I said, no, we've got it scheduled every week. Can I come back next semester? Well, I only do this in the fall. Can I come back next year? Yes, Greg, you can. He came back every, every offering for it. Uh, but there were others who did likewise. So we dealt with issues. I mean, it's, I remember asking one of our guests, who was the CEO of a company, how do you balance family and career? And he said, it cost me my first marriage. Well, I didn't know that. I knew him and I knew his wife. We'd been on board meetings, everything together. So, but he said, my second wife came out of industry and understood what the demands are on a CEO. Then I remember another leader was asked, he was the president and CEO of a major company that people would know immediately if I mentioned its name. How do you balance family career? He said, I'm the poster child and how not to do it. Mm. I'm a failure as a father. I'm a failure as a husband. And no success at work will overcome failure at home. Mm. That was on Tuesday night. He left and when he left, I told the class, I said, what he didn't tell you, on Thursday, he'll be in divorce court for the second time. Then you contrast that with Greg Brown, whose son was in over 300 basketball games, junior high through high school. Greg missed one game. The only game he missed was because he had a meeting with the prime minister of Israel. And the basketball game his son was going to be playing was one that had been canceled because of weather and they had rescheduled it and conflicted with this date. And he was tempted to try to change the date with the Israeli prime minister and his staff said, please, please don't. <laughs> it's taken us a long time to get this. So he missed one. Or then you take John Roberts, who's the CEO at J.B. Hunt Transport. And he had his wife contact his executive assistant and put all of the kids' important dates and times on his calendar, and he treated them just like another business commitment. He said, now I know that some of you may want me to stay past seven o'clock tonight, but I'm not. My son's gonna be in a baseball game tonight and I'm gonna be there, and he was. So there, there are these kinds of things that 
we I cover those in the book as well as lots of other things. The issue about balance in your life, right. how you balance things, the issue about paradoxes that come up in leadership and how you deal with those and the decisions and the mistakes and and because everyone makes mistakes. Uh, oh, I've made tons of them. But then when you do, what do you do about it? So there are just a lot of things that that I dealt with and others have dealt with that I thought we need to put this down in really, really practical ways. So there are a lot of stories in, in the book. Uh, yeah. I teach with stories and I write with stories. Uh, it, I've heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I think a story is worth a thousand pictures. Yeah. Because I've given I've given lots of speeches literally all over the world, Jeff. And when people would come up and they would remember anything from my talks, it'd be a story. Mm -hmm. It would be a story. So that's what I've tried to do in the book. Yeah. It's something we can all connect with when we can see through the lens of someone else's experience, right? And so yeah. you mentioned, John, some of the different principles and, and topics that you put in the book and in the course and things. One of those you mentioned there was the paradoxes that leaders face, the paradoxical leadership. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what that means and maybe an example and, sure. and how dealing with those paradoxes can actually help us be a more effective leader? Yeah. Well, in fact, what got me thinking about paradoxes was something that I read. Donald T. Phillips wrote a book, Lincoln on Leadership. And in it, he made the comment about how Lincoln was a master of paradox mm. and, and got me thinking about that. And so then I, that, that, that word was in my mind. And as I would read other things, other leadership things, they talk about the paradoxes that you face. And so I thought, well, I'm going to just try to list some of them. So like the whole notion that some people think that servant leadership is a paradox. And well, serving and leading how can you lead if you're serving? And so, well, that's what leadership is really all about. It's about serving the people you lead. And so it's not a paradox, but then the need to be consistent. That's important. But you dare not be so consistent that you become predictable. And so at times you have to be unpredictable. And why would that be? That's, well, that's Newton's first law. A body at rest will stay at rest unless some external force is there. That happens to an organization as well, that a body at rest, you take a company that, you know, Tim Collins talks about good to great. Well, the difficulty is once you become great, it's really hard to then continue to get better. The notion of continuous improvement. What do you have to do? You have to put tension in the organization. And that's what a leader has to be able to do is to regulate that tension to keep that body continuing to move along the way. And so just applying Newton's first law says, yep, you can't just be consistent. At times you've got to be unpredictable too. So that's an example of a paradox. I've got, 20 something paradoxes yeah. that we deal with in the book. Well, that's fun. I, I also love like connecting things like Newton's laws to leadership and personal development. And, and so this this first one that you're talking about, like an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by an external force. Like how how can that really apply? What are some examples maybe of those external or outside forces that could get a, a company, a leader or an individual to, to get moving and get from rest to acceleration? Well, disruption is one of those things, being disruptive. And we've gone through that because so many businesses have been disruptive. All you have to do is uh, try to find a blockbuster uh, store because they didn't believe that Netflix could possibly make it, but to be disruptive. And it means that as, uh, as John Roberts, the CEO at J.B. Hunt put it, he said, uh, I'm never happy. <laughs> he says, I smile, but uh, people know that I'm never satisfied. Well, that was one of the things that that my staff quickly understood, that I'm often pleased, but never satisfied. We can always get better. So you just continue to keep a bit of the pressure on about the need to improve, the need to improve, continuous improvement um, along the way. So 
that's one of them. But let's not forget about Newton's third law. Uh, Newton's third law basically says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, why is it then that, that we have this law of unintended consequences? Why is it that we haven't been able to anticipate as Judith McKenna, who heads up the international uh, business for Walmart, put it, the second bounce of the ball? Why is it that the NCAA didn't understand what the second bounce of the ball was going to be when they introduced the notion of the transfer portal or the notion of NIL and what it's going to be. Why is it that anyone was surprised that once you did the name, image, and likeness and compensation, that suddenly you were going to have boosters who are willing to put up whatever money was necessary to get certain athletes to come and play for their favorite college or university? I mean, come on now. Newton understood the third law you know, centuries and centuries ago, why is it suddenly that we are unable to anticipate what the ramifications are going to be? Because one of the engineering laws is for every solution, there's going to be a new problem created. We yeah. understood that because anytime you intervene and you create a new something, then it's changed the whole uh, ecosystem, so to speak. And you know, you're going to have other things that will come to bear. So it's just, uh, it just seems to me that too often we as engineers tend to think, oh, well, that engineering stuff only applies when we're designing machines or buildings or this or that. No, no, no. It also, those things apply in everyday life. It's really practical stuff. It's not just something that you learned in a course and forget it, you're never going to use it again. No, no, no. I look for all kinds of things that I can look back over my education and experiences and say, what can I pull from that where I could apply it and use it now to affect the kind of change that I think needs to occur within the organization? So that's, you know, it's, it's just, there is beauty and being an engineer, but there are also some challenges mm -hmm. because we as engineers, you know, we're called problem solvers. Well, Jeff, there's some problems that you as the leader should not solve. I mean, you should not be the problem solver. If anything, you should be the problem provoker. You should be asking the questions. You shouldn't be the answer person. You ought to have the questions and get other people to develop solutions I don't care how good the solution is, if it's not accepted by the people for whom it's intended, it's not going to work. It's not a good solution. So that means then that we've got to involve the people. I thought that Ron Heifetz in his book, Leadership Without Easy Answers, put it so well when he said there are technical problems, and then there are those that are called for adaptive change. Mm -hmm adaptive change. And if you've got the things where it's not a technical problem, the best people to solve those kinds of things needing adaptive change are the people who are impacted by the change. Get them involved in developing the solution. This shouldn't be a top-down sort of thing. It rather should be built up by the people who are going to have to live with the solutions themselves. And so that means getting them together and then having the dialogue and that's what we're really faced, I think, as a nation and really in the world now, is this polarization and about no notion about polarities, that we, we want to take extreme positions. But a polarity is not something to be solved or dealt. It's rather it's to be resolved. And you do that by getting the parties together and talking, communicating, and coming together to find a midpoint, and midpoint doesn't mean halfway in between, but midpoint means something that they can, is acceptable. It's not perfect for either one of them, but it's okay. It's acceptable. I can live with it. Better to be able to live with an imperfect solution than to not get the solution at all, because we also, as engineers, tend to get paralysis of analysis. We'll tend to overanalyze things. And so this notion about 
good as being the enemy of great. I'm sorry. Sometimes good is good enough. And the time and the, the expense to get to great, let's come back and do, let's eat the elephant with another bite. Let's just take a bite now, get 90% of the way there, and then come back and try to deal with the next 10% later. There's so many things that I learned through the consulting company that I had and dealing with the clients and all that you, you, you shouldn't just come in and say, okay, here's the solution. Now let's, let's walk away as the consultants would often do and leave it to the client to deal with it. You, you're going to have to take them through the, the process of implementing it, bringing it up, debugging it, doing all of these things to get the solution to work for them. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, it means that it, you get involved and you become a partner in the relationship. It's not just a external relationship, you, but you become a part of that. That you, your own reputation is tied into making sure that the client is being served well. Uh, so there are just so many things, Jeff, that I look back on my career and I just think, if I'd only known then, what I know now, what I've learned over these last many, many years, how much better I would have been. So it's one of the things I've tried to do is to capture a lot of those learnings yeah. in, in that book. Yeah, maybe wish you would have known some of those things earlier, but sometimes going through those experiences is exactly how you learn it, right? But hopefully yeah. in capturing things in the book and sharing that with others, maybe you can help others learn things sooner rather than later as well. It's all, it's all part of that, that process, right? Yeah, they won't make the same mistakes I did, but they're going to make their own mistakes. <laughs> I mean, that's for sure. But when they yeah. do, how do they deal with it? And so possibly the process that I talk about in there will help them deal with those mistakes. Yeah, so I, I was interested in in this idea that, that you kind of challenged that classic saying, good is the enemy of great. So would you say that you more ascribe to the side that done is better than perfect? Um, at least to get to the point that that, that you have uh, something completed that you can move forward with rather than, you know, having to get it just perfect, right? Which which sometimes can can delay us and we get stuck in that analysis process. Would, would, would you agree with that? Or somewhere in between, what, what what do you think here, John? Well, with practically every question that I'm asked, Jeff, the answer is it depends. Sure. Depends yeah. on the situation. I mean, the whole notion behind Six Sigma was that, you know, can you accept three uh, failures out of a thousand? Well, it depends on what's failing. And is it the plane that I'm on? Uh, no, so it really does depend. It was one of the things that Steve Sample in his book, The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership, I thought was so well stated. Did that even in the, I think the preface or the introduction said, leadership is situational and contingent. Yeah. The answer seems to always depend upon the situation at hand. You can't use a cookie cutter approach and go through and say, this is the way we're going to do it. It depends on the particular situation. So there are going to be situations in which good is the enemy of great. We need to continue to strive for greatness. But then at some point, you need to say, hmm, remember that engineering law. In fact, I went back and, and this is one that I would often use. At some point in the design of a product, you have to shoot the engineers and get on with production. You know, <laughs> that, that you can't just over-design and over-design and over-design. You've got to get a result. Because in the end, results matter. Yeah, absolutely. Any other favorite engineering laws you love to apply to, this, oh, to leadership? Oh, I, and... I, I love, in fact, uh, I don't know if you have, have seen the book. Uh, let me see. I, I pulled it out here so I could show you one of my favorites. Norm Augustine was one of my, my heroes. Norm Augustine was, um, he was the chairman of Martin Marietta and so forth, but he, he wrote this book, Augustine's Laws, and, and the, he was involved in procurement business within the government. So a lot of those were like, but in fact, there's one there that um, Augustine's third law, 90% of the time, things will turn out worse than you expect. And the other 10% of the time, you had no right to expect so much. 
<laughs> it's that there, there are a lot of those that I, I just I love. Uh, and then Murphy's law of probability. If something has a 50, 50 chance of going wrong, it'll go wrong nine times out of 10. Um, but they're just, any number of these laws that I, I like, and I've got a lot of those that are scattered throughout the book. Yeah, that's great. Now, sometimes, you know, for, for those leaders uh, in, in engineering or otherwise who are, are experiencing challenge in, in leadership, and, and maybe sometimes uh, even if they have a small team, we're not talking about someone who's a CEO uh, yeah. or someone, someone who's like maybe a, an early leader, they've got a small team of engineers, what are some of the challenges that they're facing in this in this new realm, kind of moving from that, you know, hey, I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm doing the analysis, I'm doing the calculations, I'm doing the design, and now they're in this leadership responsibility. What are some of the challenges you see to these early leaders that, uh, that and, and some of that difficulty as they're making that shift towards a leadership approach rather than I'm on, on the front lines doing the, the design and, and engineering? Well, there's several things that come to mind. Number one, if you're promoted from within, you you need to now have a separation. You can no longer be one of the guys or the gals that you're the leader now. And you have to recognize that everything you do, uh, people are interpreting it in ways that you might not have expected. Uh, I've had people who uh, became the leader and they found out that gee, they couldn't really go to lunch with the bunch anymore, that they were going without that individual, that there's going to be a separation that has to occur. Uh, the other thing is that I would hope that any leader would have the same kind of goal that I have. And that is that my goal is not to be the best leader, but to be the leader of the best team, mm. that it's all like about that. the team. And so it's about the team now. It's not about the leader and how you as the leader how you measure success is by the success of the team, that that's the key to it is do everything you can to help the team be successful. And one of the real challenges that engineers have is that when you know that if you were solving the problem, you'd come up with a better solution than your team is coming up with. But that's a whole part of the training and development, because one of the things you have to do as a leader is develop other leaders. you got to develop the people there. And so they're going to have to go through this process and, so just be real careful. Another is that, and in fact, uh, uh, Donnie Smith, who was the CEO at Tyson Foods, when you looked at his career path, he went up the mountain by going around the mountain. I mean, he held positions in which he had never had any education or experience. And so I said, Donnie, how do you do that? And he said, every time I would go in, the first thing I would do is ask the team three questions. What are we good at? What are we not good at? And if you were in charge, what would you change? He said, and then I took all of the things that they had and I went back to them and played back to them. This is what you told me that we're good at. This is what you told me we're not good at. And this is what you told me we should change. So, okay, let's change it. Let's do it. He said, remember, the answer is always in the room that you've got to rely on the people there and get them involved and let the answer come from them in the room. Uh, there's so much wisdom in that. So it doesn't matter where, where you are, at the smallest little team all the way up through those same kind of principles apply, Jeff, that the answer is always in the room, that the people you're leading often are better qualified to come up with the answers than you would be. Uh, so listen to your people, listen to what they're saying. But even more importantly, listen beyond the words, listen between the words and behind the words. In order to be able to do that, in order to have this high EQ as opposed to IQ, you first got to know yourself, but then the others, you've got to really know the people. You've got to learn their stories, learn something about them, care about them. I think that the, the greatest recommendation that I got about leadership was a quote that is often attributed 
to Teddy Roosevelt. People won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so your team members need to know you care, mm -hmm. that you care about them, that you're there to help them to develop and be successful, whatever they want to do. And if, in fact, the best thing for them is to, to leave your team and go to another team, then you've got to be able to be willing to support that if it's in their best interest. It's not so much it, whether it's in your best interest. Is it in their best interest to do that? You're in the people development process. That's what leadership is. It's developing people, developing leaders. So that's just another part of the learnings I got along the way. And it would apply to small teams or big teams. It doesn't matter. The biggest challenge is always communications. Of getting people to recognize that, well, in fact, I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that I was able to share it with you. And that was, I know you believe, you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize what you heard, heard is not what I meant. That <laughs> it's just the whole notion of communication, of getting getting the message correctly. Right. Yeah. So many of my problems and mistakes along the way were mistakes of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and I can look back to, um, right, I think it connects for, for me sometimes in, in what was sometimes called the curse of knowledge. <laughs> you know, the person who's doing the communicating and sharing, you know, has that understanding of what they're sharing. And so they think that I think that as I share that with someone else, that they're just going to grasp it all up and soak it up like a sponge. It doesn't work like that. And, and as you say, you know, well, what I was trying to communicate is not what you think that you heard. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. It, it just does. The things get lost in translation. And so, you know, different ways to verify and, and listen, not just talk um, is, is critical. And, and I love some of the things you shared. Yeah, in fact, something you just said reminds me that I think that, you probably, you and I are probably more alike than you might think. When I started out in leading, I thought I should lead the way I want to be led. That's not right. Not everyone wants to be led the same way. People are different. Uh, that's why you don't treat people equally. You treat them fairly. Okay. Yeah. And you treat them fairly. And so there's some people who want to just be, tell me what the end state is and let me go get it. Others, you've got to be after them. It's trust and verify. I mean, you've got to follow up and follow up and follow up. And I was terrible about that. I assumed that but when I told someone, here's what we should do, I didn't have to go back and check with them. That it was going to get done. Yeah. No, big mistake. Yeah. Big mistake. Yeah, it reminds me um, kind of the difference I've heard about the, the golden rule, treat people the way that you want to be treated versus what I've heard called the platinum rule, treat others the way that they want to be treated, you know, like, or, or lead people the, the way that's best for them in that context, not necessarily the way that you want to be led in, in the context of what you're talking about there. Yeah. But you didn't, you didn't state the engineer's golden rule. Oh, let's hear it. Them with the gold make the rules. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. John, this has been such a fun conversation. Any other piece of advice uh, for engineers to become the, the best possible leader that they can be and really become exemplary leaders? Well, my secret sauce for leadership is listen, learn, love, and lead. Starts with listening. Mm -hmm. Really, really listening. Not interrupting people when they're trying to, but listening listening with every part of your body, listening, and then learn from that and love the people you're leading. Now go out and lead. That's what I call leadership secret sauce. It's all about listening. It's all about learning. It's all about loving in order to be all about leading. Yeah. John, what a fun conversation. And uh, at this point, we're going to transition over to the Take Action Today segment of the show. We'll get one final piece of actionable advice from John. We'll be right back.
Now it's time for our Take Action Today segment of the show. John, we've had a fun conversation on leadership and engineering laws and practicalities and paradoxes and all sorts of different things. But what would you say and suggest for those who are listening who they want to grow into becoming better leaders, becoming better people, right? What actions would you suggest for them to take today and this week so that they can grow into the person they want to become? They need to be brutally honest, brutally honest with themselves and assess what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. I mean, brutally honest. Not You're not faking anybody on this now because it, the only person that you're going to hurt by not being brutally honest is yourself. But you know, experience says we aren't real good at assessing our own strengths and weaknesses. So we need somebody that we can trust to give us the honest, honest feedback that we need. Asking someone to tell us what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses, you see them. And by the way, that's not gonna be easy for anyone. Uh, I don't care who it is that you ask, they're gonna see you differently than someone else sees you. So maybe it means if you could, if you could possibly find two, three, or four, if you could find five, then it would be nothing short of a miracle to find five people who would give you honest feedback in assessing your strengths and your weaknesses. Now, Strengths Finder is a good way to start, but Strengths Finder has them already in the categories, but you need the qualitative assessment of people around you. That's the thing that until you know yourself, you cannot possibly know other people well enough to lead them effectively. Well said, well said. Well, John, this has been such a fabulous conversation. I, I really think that our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. And, and so if they want to learn more, engage more, connect with you and grab the book, where would you suggest they go to go find it? Well, they can go to any of the major retailers. It's out there, Why It Matters, Reflections on Practical Leadership. They could go to my website, which is John A. White Jr., J-O-H-N-A-W-H-I-T-E, jr.com slash why it matters and there they you can click where you want to order now there are four different places you could do it uh i'm on linkedin they could get on my linkedin page uh, i've got a linkedin page where i have lots of resources in fact on the website when i when i did the manuscript i had to cut the manuscript in half Ooh. The other half is on my website now because I wasn't going to just throw it out on the cutting room floor. So there's a lot of other information there that's available on the website. Great. Great. Well, thanks for a great conversation, John. Wish you nothing but the best as you continue forward and, and shaping and, and teaching and sharing your message and, and lessons learned. Thanks so much for having a great conversation here on the podcast. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. You can go to www.engineeringmanagementinstitute.org where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in the episode as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books that we mentioned. And don't forget to check out any upcoming live webinars also at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. Additionally, for any engineers who are struggling and need help taking the next career step, I've created some free training resources with an opportunity to join a more intensive program called the Engineering Career Accelerator. You can find more information at engineeringcareeraccelerator.com. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.